Good morning. This is Bill from out of Europe in Naples on another muggy Florida Wednesday. It's particularly humid today. Uh, you know, it's just dripping as you're walking around. It feels horrible. But again, season draws near. We only have probably another three or four months before things become bearable. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, you know, a quick side note today. Uh, if we're all going to take part in a civilization and have a civilization, then it's important for people to act like that. And, you know, I'm looking at you, the guy with that, you know, seven-year-old Nissan Altima with the dinged-up fenders running a temp spare who rode my ass at, you know, 107-mile-an-hour approach on the interstate three inches off my bumper until, you know, he could maneuver over to the right lane. You know, stop. Just stop doing that. Because here's the thing. I don't know where you're going, but I promise you, when you get there, nobody cares that you've arrived. They really don't. So, uh, you know, tone it down. You know, drive within 10 miles of the speed limit. Act like a normal, proper person. And maybe we can all participate in having a nice civilization and a good country. But I digress. I have today this 1987 Porsche 944 S. Uh, I feel very fortunate to have it for a variety of reasons. Uh, number one, it was a car of my youth. So, uh, you know, when I was kind of a teenager in the 1980s, uh, this thing meant a lot to me. It was a really neat piece. I, you know, I wasn't a Porsche purist, obviously. I'm 15 years old, you know. I have no idea that this thing's hated by the purists who think every uh, Porsche should have an air-cooled rear-engine setup. Uh, you know, in the 70s, Porsche came out with the 924. Uh, in fact, we have one of those sitting over there. Uh, a purple one, which we'll get into later. <clears throat> but um, the car was basically built maybe to be an Audi, uh, and then Porsche kind of took it over. The thing had an Audi engine, and one could say that it and the 928 were the beginning of Porsche's road to perdition, if you look at it that way. Uh, other people might look at it and say the thing was the road to modernity, you know, that this old air-cooled setup just was something unsustainable in the future. And, uh, you know, so they, Porsche came out with the thing. They sold pretty well. They were neat. Uh, they had a great suspension, but a weak motor. Couldn't really get out of their own way. Porsche came under a lot of flack for selling a car with an Audi engine. Uh, so instead of, you know, just saying, okay, we're sorry and backing out of it, they doubled down and they came up with this. This was the answer to all the criticisms of the 924, which was frankly a good car. Uh, but this was the 944. And it took the styling from a car called the 924 GTS, something they ran at Le Mans. I think they finished seventh overall. Uh, was a very, very cool car. And what it did was add these big box flare fenders and had a true uh, Porsche motor under the hood and that changed things. Uh, in fact, um, the Porsche motor under the hood was a 2.5 liter four cylinder, which was essentially half of the car, or uh, sorry, half of the engine they put in the 928s, another car that uh, Porsche purists hated. But anyway, this was a bit of an iconic car in the 80s. It was very popular. It sold very well. Uh, you could say it was the, um, uh, you know, uh, the beginning of the Boxster and the, uh, <coughs> you know, the, the cars that would follow. And uh, people liked it, except for, again, the Porsche Pura. So they did sell a bunch. Uh, you know, it was immortalized in movie and song. You remember that Welcome to the Boomtown song, uh, Miss Christina drove a 944. God, I love that song. And uh, anyway, the car sort of immortalized and emblazoned in my brain as an icon of the 80s. They've always underperformed price-wise. Only recently have they started coming into their own, which is a bit of a shame in the sense that they're becoming less attainable. Uh, because for, you know, a measly few bucks, you could get a very beautifully tuned Porsche with an incredible suspension. Uh, you know, something that is a true sports car and uh, enjoy it and drive it around and have fun with it. But of course, prices have started going up as they always do. And uh, that's, uh, you know, going to become less attainable. But the good news is even the great ones like this one, and this one is a great one, uh, you know, are still at a reasonable enough price that most uh, normal mortals can attain them. Uh, real quick about this. So it's, again, 87. This is a 944S. That was an important evolution uh, in the 944 lineup. Uh, in fact, it started in 85 when they changed, uh, you know, quite a few things with the 44. Got a new dashboard, 
uh, tuned the suspension, up the horsepower, uh, made it a better car. And then the S came along, and frankly, it's the one that I would have ordered. You know, the turbos are the one people talk about them. They're quick, uh, they're fun, but they are horrifically unreliable and uh, generally high maintenance, which is a shame because in a track car, you know, something you want to use as a track hobby, you have to have reliability. It's why so many of us drive Miatas out on the track. And this S may be the ultimate incarnation of something that would be used by an SCCA club member. So, you know, it's got all the hot rotted suspension, pretty close to what the turbo had, bigger brakes, updated suspension, uh, updated uh, transmission, uh, and uh, of course 40 more horsepower than the original 944. Uh, but it doesn't have that big hot turbo under the hood, making things less reliable. Uh, this is a one owner car, finished in guards red, uh, owned by a very particular OCD style accountant guy who owned it, you know, since new, kept all his service records, kept it indoors, kept it gorgeous, and uh, I feel very lucky that we took it in on trade. Uh, you can see the styling is lovely. Those box fenders are timeless absolutely timeless those big flares gorgeous to look at and really give the car a racy and current look i mean you look at this design now uh it 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 held up it looks terrific it's not something that you think oh look at that old turd uh it's got a uh, really really attractive style to it uh there's a few things i don't like but we'll get into them uh, you can see for instance this one has the phone dial wheels i mentioned that to uh our office girl yesterday, Stephanie, very nice girl, and I said, look at this, they came with the phone dials instead of the Fuchs wheels, and she just looked at me like, what the hell are you talking about? I mean, she's a snowflake, she's in her 20s, she doesn't know how to dial a telephone, she wouldn't have a clue what that even means, so uh, for any of you snowflake types watching that, that's the way we used to call people. You see those holes in the wheel? Uh, there was something very similar on a telephone, and you'd put your finger in it and spin it around to the number you desired, and uh, frankly, it was a lovely analog way of doing things, but, you know, like everything else, it went on to the ash heap of history. Uh, all right, let's just get into this thing. I'm going to start inside the hatch. Now, the 44, unlike the 24 of, you know, the initial offerings, offered this big sort of almost whale tail spoiler. Uh, definitely made it look a bit more Porsche-like. Uh, the bumpers integrated with little rubber caps on the U.S. models. Uh, this guy, he put a stainless exhaust on it, one of the very few modifications he did. And, uh, you know, looks great, sounds great. But anyway, let's get into this thing. I'm very happy it doesn't have one of those really nasty looking uh, light kits between the taillights that say Porsche. A lot of guys did that. They had that thing that bolted in there, moved the license plate down here, and uh, I just thought it looked silly. This is much more proper. Uh, you know, if you look back here, this thing is an absolute time machine. You can see I can roll up the cargo cover there. There's a set of Coco mats he bought for it. You know a guy loves his car when he buys $250 floor mats. Uh, you can see the carpet is immaculate. It's still got this uh, rolled up uh, cover uh, for the uh, sunroof, which you can pop out. Uh, he added uh, speakers to the car, which is a little bit of a shame. Collectability-wise, I'd like to see those not be in there, but they're fine, and they help the, uh, the car have better sound. But if you look at the tightness of the carpet, all around. If you look at the way everything's, you know, together still, uh, the top of the rear seat, ones that have been kept in the sun, that can be all blown out. Uh, this thing is just such a time machine. Absolutely gorgeous. Also nice that the uh, struts have been replaced at some point and actually do hold uh, the uh, big heavy uh, hatchback area up. Have a look under the hood. Okay, if you look close here, and I'll zoom in, on the uh, front fenders, there's these uh, 16 Ventilar uh, badges. And again, that's a pretty important thing because what that means is an 87. There we go with the working struts again. Uh, this thing got an upgrade uh, all the way up to about 190 horse, uh, which was, you know, significant for the 44 at the time. Uh, dual overhead camshaft, uh, 2.5 liters, which is a pretty big four pot, and uh, a lovely revving uh, setup in this thing. It was actually set up by... Um, uh, the motor originally had all these balance shafts in it that they had to license for Mitsubishi. They tried immediately coming up with their own design, but they couldn't improve on the Mitsubishi design, so they just licensed it. It cost them like 10 bucks a car to use the, uh, 
uh, use the patent, but it worked pretty well. So what they did by virtue of doing that was make these four cylinders every bit as smooth as a six cylinder, a very nice modern setup. And uh, they improved it immeasurably with this engine, this uh, 2.5 16 valve that brought the uh, two cams into play and let the engine breathe a lot more and really up the horsepower. Uh, condition wise, I mean, come on, man. I opened the hood of that 924 over there, it looks like a giant turd. Uh, this thing is immaculate, and you can see that it's been garaged and maintained by somebody who really cares, and uh, that's just neat. Uh, the padding under the hood, all very nice, all the Octung stickers with the lightning bolts. Uh, you know, it, the one thing that's neat about these cars is they really are Porsches, despite what the purists will tell you. This is a Porsche engine, it's a Porsche feel under the hood, uh, you know, you just get this lovely feel from it that you don't get from other cars and it's so well built uh, because the Germans were making such nice stuff in the 80s so uh, anyway everything nice and proper under there and love the pop-up headlights I'll pop those when we hop in and uh, everything very very proper now on top they had this giant sunroof uh, Based on the design, it wasn't something they could do where it would slide back. So instead, uh, it's got a little power function to tilt it up, or you can just remove it entirely and put it in the uh, hatch inside that cover. So you get a nice big hole in the roof. And uh, that was kind of a neat feature of the 44. Oh God, I just like standing back and looking at it. Uh, four wheel disc brakes. Uh, it uses a torsion, uh, what do they call it, a torque tube setup. So uh, it has this front engine, uh, you know, four cylinder running through a torque tube like a prop shaft into a five speed transaxle between the back uh, the, between the back wheels and that's very you know Ferrari Corvette style stuff so uh, as a result it has a perfect 50-50 weight distribution and became one of the best handling cars on the market. Car and driver just raved about the handling of this car. Uh, perfectly neutral you could fling it around you could break it loose it would be easy to bring back again and uh, was just a lovely car to have spirited driving. Uh, here's one of my complaints uh, Porsche dealers added these really stupid uh, alarm systems that had a separate key. Uh, you can see I've got like 50 keys for this stupid thing. Uh, and they put this, uh, this stupid thing right here in the back fender, which just looks ludicrous to me. I remember seeing this in a bunch of 44s. And I mean, I get it. I mean, the 80s could be a rough time, especially in the big cities. People were probably robbing these things, but they definitely could have come up with a nicer way to integrate the alarm system. All right, inside, again, as with the outside of this car, the way it's just been kept is awesome. Uh, in 85, they did change the dashboard, uh, became much more stylistic, less like the, uh, the Audi, more like the rest of the Porsche lineup and the 928 and such. Uh, all of these dashboards cracked. Uh, they were a real weak spot in this car. To see this in this condition is epic. Uh, the guy realized pretty quick that the dashboard was a weak point and had a cover on it from before it was cracked, not after. So again, conscientious ownership. Uh, you know, all the materials, the fit and finish, are nice, but not ultra luxurious, just perfect for a sports car, tight together, lovely classic Porsche window switches, nice little classic Porsche power mirror adjustments. Uh, he did not cut the door panels and he saved the original speakers so they can go back in there without any problem. Uh, little places to put switch, well, you're not gonna get much of a gun in there, you're definitely not gonna get a 357, maybe a little 380 or something. I suppose you could put a, I don't know, a stiletto or something in there, but good lord, not a lot of weapon storage in this car. Uh, it has semi-power seats, you can move them up down with this guy, and uh, of course two little handles to move forward and back or uh, move the headrest back. Uh, the rear seats, a little bit laughable. Obviously, you could stuff a couple Canadians back there. They'll be cheerful enough, but uh, otherwise, you're pretty much relegated to kids. And you can see the top of it folds down for a little bit more cargo storage. Look, the door jam is perfect. I mean, it's so nice to find one of these cars this well-preserved. Really, really incredible. All right, sitting behind the wheel is a very nice place to be. Uh, you're sitting upright, you got great view, great visibility. Move the seat back a little bit. And there we go. You've got a beautifully laid out instrument cluster. Let me get the uh, air conditioning on, it's hot as 
ball sack in here. God, wonderful. One of those cars you could still start in neutral without your foot on the clutch. Get my seatbelt on so it stops that ridiculous binging. I don't know what it is with German buzzers in the 80s, but it's all like the U-boat is sinking, you know? Okay, so I've got nice ice cold air shooting at me through the vents. That's by virtue of good maintenance. Uh, again, a beautiful instrument cluster. You got your water temp, your fuel, all with the great German hieroglyphics, 160 mile an hour speedo. Uh, you got your oil pressure, your voltmeter, your tack, everything you need right there in front of you. A nice three spoke steering wheel. The horn, lovely, leather wrapped, feels nice to grip. Uh, you know, everything just nicely laid out and very Porsche-like. Uh, you can see your rear defrost, your climate control. Uh, it has the original Blaupunkt still, which is fantastic, nice to see. Uh, there's a spot you could probably fit a compact 9 in, so. Uh, it's got, uh, what is this thing? There's the uh, sunroof working. You can vent it like that, put it back down again. Uh, that was a bit of a weak spot. Those things could uh, go south, so he obviously maintained that to keep it working. Uh, digital clock here in great shape, lighter. Got a uh, glove box with uh, the original manuals in it, some books. Got a stack of service records here. Uh, I'm just gonna pull one out to show you because it's an important one. And there it is. Uh, this thing had the uh, timing belt and water pump job uh, done at 78,000 miles back in uh, uh, July of 16. So uh, very fresh timing belt and water pump in this car. And uh, that is one of the few areas where, you know, you want to make sure your maintenance is up to date. So that's something you're not going to have to worry about for another, oh God, I don't know, 60,000 miles or so, uh, which uh, really does add value to this particular car. I love the very simple uh, gear shift, absolutely fantastic. Leather, leather, nice. Guards red with a stick and, oh geez, what a machine. And let's see if I can get in here and go for a spin. God, does this bring back memories. You know, again, I would, we did that Pagoda yesterday and I was talking about you know what the uh, what the world has lost in terms of uh, these sort of special cars of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. You know how neat they were and how different they are from the cars of today, and that is so true. I mean, you know, you look at a modern version of this car; it's all throttle by wire, throttle by brakes, electric steering. You know, all these things that are designed to have the computer interpret how you want to steer or brake or accelerate the car, and then do it for you. Not so in a car like this. Uh, you know, this thing is, it's a machine that you're attached to. I may hit the lights while we're here. Look how cool that is. I love pop-up headlights. It's another thing we've lost. Can't have them anymore. But, um, you know, this is a machine, and in, in a way it shames modern cars because it delivers for the driver something that they just don't do anymore, and that is a pure connection to the mechanicals around you. You know, this steering, the feeling is, is perfect. It's, it's a rack and pinion, it's connected directly to the front wheels without any interpretation. There's that 16 valve breathing. You know, they're not a screaming fast car, but they're enough, they're peppy, they feel terrific. I mean, I guess the closest thing I could describe it to uh, is like a Miata, you know, with more power, an absolute joy to drive, a joy to shift, uh, the feeling in the seat of your pants. You don't have to go really, really fast to have fun in this car. You're sitting low to the ground, you can dissect traffic like a surgeon. Man, and you know, the way this car has been maintained, I get the feeling of what it was like to have a new one back in 87. Look at that. I'm not gonna over rev it, we're still not really up to temp, but uh, I mean, you get the feeling. I mean, what a fun car to drive. And uh, if you know, they can be high in maintenance, I hear that anyway, but that's mostly because they were so cheap for so long. About a, you know, a bunch of terrible people bought them and didn't really maintain them well. Uh, you know, with this thing, it's been so well looked after, uh, you're just not gonna have the same problems. Oh, sorry for the sun, that's annoying. Let's see if I can get up enough to tone it down. Yeah, there it is. 
So anyway, there it is, 1987 Porsche 944 S, one owner, 84,000 miles, incredible maintenance on this car, all original, original paint, original leather, original everything, and I love it. Second, oh, that's third gear, that ain't good. Uh, second time in two days that I've got a car I wanna own. It's really annoying. Actually, third time in recent memory that Trans Am, uh, I'm gonna need a bigger garage. Uh, okay, look, come get this special car. You're not going to find a better one. You can look and look and look. Maybe you've been looking for a while. Uh, if you have, this is it. Come get it. 239-298-8000 uh, on the web at aenaples.com. Thank you so much for having a look. We appreciate it. We'll see you with the next one. Take care.